Thanks everyone for coming. Good afternoon. Before we get started, um, I've got a couple of announcements to make. Uh, first announcement, uh, the Big Give has started. So I, I think I looked at the clock last at about 1.15 and there was a little under 3 million at the time. Um, when we get to 10,000, the trustees will match us $100,000. So biggive.berkeley.edu. I did it today for the first time, I have to admit. And uh, it was quick and easy. Lots of options you can donate to. So that's a big gift. Um, second, I'd like to bring Kira Stola from the Office of Sustainability. Come on up, Kira. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. And uh, in the spirit of big give, um, I want to ask, do you think Berkeley can be the coolest you see? Absolutely. And are you ready to help us be the coolest you see? Yeah, <laughs> let's have a round of applause. All right, so there's lots of ways to do it. All of our actions are meaningful. Um, our collective action is even better. And now we have a fun way for you to really engage and pledge to reduce our campus's carbon footprint. Coming in April, there's lots of things going on on campus, but for the month of April, there's gonna be a challenge called the Cool Campus Challenge. Berkeley's gonna have an opportunity to compete against all the other UCs and UC Office of the President for the honor of being the coolest UC. How do we do that? Each of us will have an opportunity to pledge up to 60 different actions we can do and more that actually will reduce our carbon footprint on campus. Things from saving energy to reducing our waste to saving water, all kinds of things that will have an impact on our carbon footprint here at the Berkeley campus. So. What I'd like you to do is go to coolcampuschallenge.org and sign up for the challenge. On April 1st, the challenge will open. And I uh, just want to give you a little bit of a preview of what you'll see. You'll sign up. You can sign up today. And you'll get a notice on April 1st that we're opening up. And you will then create a profile. And in that profile, you're going to be able to see a whole bunch of different actions you can choose to take. You can invite friends to come and join in. You can form teams. You can see real time on a leaderboard how Berkeley is doing in comparison and how many points we're earning for those carbon action pledges. So everyone is invited, faculty, staff, and students. It's easy. Last time we did this, um, we had 1,700 people at Berkeley participate. Let's double that. Let's triple that. Let's have fun, let's reduce our carbon footprint, and you will be hearing more from us. Messages will be going out to the campus soon. Thanks. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Kira. I think I got this from Jerry Urardi, but I love to go off the script. First thing Kira did, she is serious about this. She came up and she says, we've got to hide these bottles of water. And she hid all the bottles of water behind. She is serious about sustainability. Today is March 14th, Pi Day. So we have a pie to give away. An Alala Berry pie, I think that's how you say it. I had to look that up. I believe it's a hybrid between a raspberry and a blueberry. Blackberry, some berries. It sounds fantastic from Fat Apples. So if you look on the back of your chair or the chair in front of you, there should be in front of one chair, a, an envelope for this fantastic, I know, the front row, sorry. <laughs> We've got a pie here. <gasps> Fabulous. Come on up, please. I can sample it and make sure it's safe. <laughs> Guess we should get on with the program. I would like to introduce Vice Chancellor Mark Fisher. Mark, please come on up. I have a bright red time's up. Okay, Mark. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is our third in a series of town halls, and uh, it's nice to see 
those of you who came out on a sunny day when there are probably a lot of other fun things you could be doing. So um, uh, I know all of you are busy. It's a busy time of year. We have a lot going on. You're going to see some of that today as we go through our program, and um, we'll be providing a lot of updates. The program, by the way, is set up, someone asked a question, what are the things that you're in VCA and your office you're really concerned with or working on? Where are your priorities? And I think what you'll see as you come to these meetings, that's the agenda. So when you see a topic here, you can pretty much guess it's consuming a lot of time in our office. And then this was what the, the, the Vice Chancellor of Administration um, suite of operations are really working on or hyper-focused on. So with that, think about who's here today and you'll get a sense of where we spend a lot of time right now. We've been talking a lot about, or in the course of these um, uh, meetings, the Chancellor brought up something, uh, doing less with less as terminology, and I know there was some concern about what that means and um, whether that was sort of a hollow um, issue that, you know, we really never do less with less, we just do more with less. As, and so we want to touch on that today, and we really think of this as how can we um, work smarter. So some of what you'll see or hear will fit neatly into a less with less kind of um, uh, language. And other things are just, how can we really take the resources we have on the campus and use them in the best way possible? So you're gonna hear some of that from some of the speakers. And I think it's really important for us as a division over the course of this year to really emphasize how we can make um, doing your job and our jobs uh, simpler, uh, less complicated, more efficient, whatever the right terminology is, smarter, and um, being able to make sure that the workload on the campus is really aligned with the workforce that we have on campus. So you'll be hearing more about that today, and you'll be hearing more about that in the future. So um, I have some special guests today. Um, our Vice Chancellor for Research, Randy Katz, is here, and Oscar Dubon, our Vice Chancellor for equity and inclusion is going to be here, I hope. So I don't see, an, is Oscar somewhere in that there? I just, my eyesight's awful, but no Oscar, we'll get Oscar here. Um, and our first speaker though today is our uh, relatively new Chief Procurement Officer. This is Russ Chung. You met Russ probably in our last meeting. He was introduced probably at that meeting. And um, he is going to give you an update on what we're doing in terms of procurement and uh, working smarter and doing less with less. So Russ. Please take over. Okay, actually, I was here, actually, I think on the 10th of October, which was my second day here, I believe. So I did get a chance to, uh, to uh, introduce myself. So I like to start every meeting, or certainly if I give a presentation with this, so why the heck are we here? Why is my staff, and how do I prioritize stuff for my staff? And it really is about supporting the mission of the university. It's about academics, our students. It's about teaching. It's about uh, research. And it's about global and uh, local outreach service. And I do tell my staff, if what we're doing does not support the mission of the university, then we have to find ways to stop doing uh, what we're doing. So a uh, little bit of background about me. Um, I've been here uh, just over five months now and I came to uh, uh, this wonderful university. Uh, prior to this I was at the City University of New York. So um, in uh, supporting the five boroughs of New York City, over 220,000 students, uh, 25 uh, colleges, and I was a CPO uh, there. Prior to that I was at the Ohio State University uh, large university, actually slightly more diverse than this because you have like um, College of Medicine and you have uh, agriculture. So it's like throw in uh, Davis in here also. So it's, it's quite diverse uh, uh, university. And then prior to that, uh, um, my procurement supply chain experience with uh, General Motors where I was lucky enough to be uh, managing and leading global teams, and I was lucky enough to, to live uh, overseas uh, several times in Asia. And then uh, another strange country, Wisconsin, where I was, uh, where I was uh, the uh, head of procurement for the uh, Kohler Company uh, bathroom uh, products and fixtures. And then back again here, I'm so excited to be part of this great, great university. Um, uh, I am part of the UC system. I have to apologize. I'm, I'm from uh, UCLA, but it's great to be back here. And that's what drove me back, is really supporting this tremendous, tremendous university and influence, influencing uh, 
people's lives, the mission of the university, and uh, uh, research. So uh, just quickly, by the numbers, what the heck does supply chain procurement uh, do? Almost 213,000 purchase orders. Over 4,500 unique users log on, excuse me, to bear by every month a PO spend of just over $526 million. And in uh, 2018, recorded uh, $18.43 million as reported by uh, the UC system through our uh, uh, benefits bank. But that's not why we're here. We're here about what are we doing to, uh, you know, just one topic here. What are we doing about leaning the procurement process? This slide says it all, I think, for many of you. Some, uh, someone commented back, you know, they said, actually, I just go into uh, hibernation when I put it into uh, bear by. So um, here's some, I, you know, some numbers that, that when I started looking at, at the data, it was, it, it, it showed that we really need to work on leaning our process. So only 20, so only 29% of requisitions are approved uh, and released by PO the same day. How's that compared to our peer data? Our peer data, so similar universities, 70% to 92%. Same day, requisition to PO out the same day. Our friends across the bay, UCSF, 79%. Requisition to PO the same day. 56% of our requisitions are less than $250. So we're processing a lot and lot of low dollar requisitions going through a very lengthy approval process. Um, so this is astounding. Every cart, regardless of the dollar amount, goes to someone, a requisition approver and a creator. And here's the crazy thing, I keep asking my staff, is this truly true? Because I don't believe it's true. Regardless of the dollar amount, it still goes to a requisition creator for either creation or approver. Um, here's a, you know, it kind of shows graphically where the bottleneck is. You have 378,000 orders, 213,000 POs, you have 4,500, 4, 100 unique users, and it's going through 185 requisition creators. And if it's over $5,000, it goes to 23 buyers. So what are we doing about this? I'm really excited about this. Come April 14th, why the 14th? Because UC Path is going to be successful on the 1st, so we're letting that wonderful thing happen. So I actually moved it out to the 14th. I didn't want it 15th because that's Monday, that's tax day. So the 14th, um, what are we going to do? Catalog orders, less than 5,000. And non-catalog orders, less than 1,000, will not touch a requisition of approver. If the chart string is correct, it's going to go straight out to purchase order. <laughs> what does that actually mean? If you're a lab manager, right? You're a lab manager. You put in a Fisher order, right? You know, 12 items, $2,300. That PO, you do it before 2 o'clock. Well, actually, we batch order. So I'd say do it before 1 to be safe. 2 o'clock, that order's at Fisher. They're packing. They're loading the next day. They're in Tracy, California. It could be, it should be on your desk the next day. And that's really, really exciting stuff. The, uh, pr the uh, invoice, you know, working with the controller's office, if the PO, if the invoice matches the PO within our match exception rules, it will pay. So invoice approver is bypassed also. That part is bypassed. I, this is extremely exciting stuff. I, 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 you know, I'm glad you're excited because I'm excited about this stuff. So what's it going to impact? It will impact between 80, 8,000 to 109,000 requisitions or orders. That's a heck of a lot of stuff out there. Um, so quick update. What else are we doing? Uh, we've moved the low value purchase uh, va uh, authorization from 5,000 to 10,000. We actually got in line with what the UC 
uh, Office of Procurement has suggested, and now these crazy department uh, uh, justification on, on, on uh, the uh, procurement process. We've moved it from 10,000 to 100,000, and all we did was align what the UC had out there. So we moved from 10,000 to 100,000. Um, and so, you know, these are just real simple things. A lot of work went into this. You know, all I did was put a little focus on what was happening and got people energized and excited about this, this kind of stuff. Um, so if you have any questions, but more importantly, you need training on this stuff, uh, give us a call, give us an email, and we'll be out there uh, assisting you. And lastly, I just, I just really want to thank the folks that, um, that worked on this, and that was part of a procurement team, but it was also a cross-functional team, including the lean team that worked on this early, and also uh, our controller's office and accounts payable that really made this successful um, to assist you in going back to the original slides, supporting the mission of this great, great university. Thanks. <laughs> With that, I, sh I want to introduce Seamus. In truly an exciting world of transportation, maybe not as exciting in parking, but certainly the exciting world of transportation. Oh, sure. Um, I guess I have a couple seconds while he fixes this. See, this wasn't deliberate, so I guess I can take a couple questions real quick if there are any, and we'll take some at the end. Yes. Actually, the 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 five to ten thousand we want to do it concurrently with uh, auto approval. The 10,000 to 100,000 already went in at the end of January. So the forms have changed. We're concurrent with the forms at UC, which is really good because now we just link directly to the UC forms so we don't have to con continually update. We'll have time for questions at the end. And again, feel free to email um, uh, us on additional questions. So. Wow, that's hard to, uh, hard to follow, but we're excited about purchasing, we're gonna get excited about transportation. So I am uh, Seamus Holmott, Director of Parking and Transportation and Mail Services, and what I wanna do today is go over some mail services um, stats and some things that they're doing um, to be able to do uh, less with less, and then we'll go through some uh, transportation issues and how we can help you get to campus, and then we'll talk a little bit about the future of parking. So as we go through this, um, so, mail services, Mikey, are you in the audience here? I know there were some other uh, folks here. Mikey's one of our stars. Uh, so we do, what's that, 244 stops. We were doing 300 stops. We had to reduce that, uh, the number of days that we actually deliver mail. We've sort of tweaked that. So you're still all getting your mail, it just might not be every day. So we're not able to do it five days a week these days, but we're still able to deliver more than uh, 1.1, 1.2 million pieces of mail. Um, but the things that we're really excited about um, and really are proud of are 8,000 pounds of toner cartridge recycling. I know Kira is happy about that, right? And almost 320,000 pounds of shredding that then goes to recycling. So those are good things that you are all helping us do. Now, let's switch over to transportation. How are you all getting to campus? This is showing you how you get to campus. So this is faculty and staff. Uh, you told us how you get to campus. The biggest triangle that you see there is people who drive alone. So you get in your car and you drive alone, you come to campus. Um, it's just below 40%. Even though that sounds like a big number, it's actually really good. The other big numbers up there, we have lots of people that are able to take BART, because we have BART across the street from us. We have people who are able to take the bus. We have people who can bike. Quite a few people are able to bike to campus. Uh, which is fantastic. And I know that we are uh, working with the city trying to improve the streets around Berkeley uh, and around our campus to make them safer for bike riding. When you fold in the students, you actually get down to our drive alone rate is below 17%, which is amazing. And how does this help us? It helps us in many different ways. One, uh, it reduces our carbon footprint. So if fewer people are actually driving by themselves to come to campus, the better. The other thing it really helps us with, uh, which some of you may not like, but it helps us reduce the number of parking spaces that we have to have on campus, right? If we have, I know, I know, less with less, right? <laughs> but if you think about it, if we have 60,000 people showing up to uh, campus every day, and if 90% you know, of those people drove themselves, um, that's a lot of cars, right? 56,000 cars or something like that. That would be way too many cars to bring to campus and parking spaces. So how do we help you get to campus without driving a car? 
right? We offer lots of alternatives. And uh, those of you who don't know, uh, the last couple of months I've realized that we're not doing a great job of getting the word out because I'll tell this to people and they go, really? I can get this from you? Yeah, so we do a couple of things. So we do a BART subsidy. So if you want to try BART, if you don't do it already, uh, we will give you a $10 a month subsidy. So if you buy uh, $45 worth of BART, we'll give it, you $10 off, it's only $35. And there's actually even a better deal. So if you go and through us, you buy a uh, $48 value BART card, BART will take $3 off. So it's already down to $45. We'll give you $10 off. It's down to $35, and you can still do that pre-tax. So trying out BART is very, very easy and inexpensive if you can do it. We also do the same thing for AC Transit. So we highly subsidize uh, the, uh, uh, what's called an easy pass. So it's a monthly bus pass. So for $42 a month, you can get an AC Transit bus pass that you can now ride uh, AC Transit anywhere it goes, including into the city. And if you want to go and buy a Transbay uh, uh, bus pass for a month, that's almost a $200 uh, cost. So for $42 a month that you can do pre-tax, uh, we will help subsidize your uh, rides on AC Transit. Once you get to campus, how do you get around campus? Well, we run the campus shuttle. We run a shuttle that's the perimeter, picks you up down at BART, takes you around campus. So if you uh, pick it up down by BART, you want to need to get up the hill, we'll take you up the hill. Those of you who walk uh, and live up the hill, uh, I should, sorry to say, who work up the hill, looking over here at Paula, uh, we run a shuttle from the mining circle all the way up to Lawrence Hall of Science and the Space Sciences and Math Sciences Lab. Those of you who work down at Campus Shared Services, we run the shuttle that goes from North Berkeley BART to Campus Shared Services, and we run a shuttle out to Richmond Field Station. So we really help you get around campus once you get here. So we have the commute options, and then we have the get around campus options. And I'll talk about, we may be adding a new shuttle uh, route uh, come uh, at the end of this summer. But how do you find these shuttles? So you can get real-time information. We have uh, an app, it's called Nextbus. It's not our app, but nextbus.com. You can get it on your desktop, you can get it on a mobile phone, and it will show you uh, when the next bus is showing up. And so you can still work at your, at your workstation. The, my bus isn't showing up for another 30 minutes, so I'm gonna keep working. And oh, it's five minutes away. Let me close down, head down to the bus stop, hop on the bus. Um, so these are for our perimeter shuttles, and AC Transit is on the same system. So you get real-time information about how to get uh, around campus and on the bus. We also offer and run um, our Loop program, which is the ADA golf cart. We're able to take people um, from building to building. We, we pre-screen people through the DSA office, and um, we again have another mobile app that's very much like a ride hailing. You choose, you say, please pick me up here and I want to be dropped off there. And we'll come and we'll pick you up. Fully electric, we have two fully electric vehicles um, driving around campus uh, and that goes all the way till 10 o'clock at night to be able to get you from building to building on campus. Um, and these ones we can actually go a little bit off campus these days too because it's street legal. And one of the questions that was submitted before the town hall was, hey, these things, I've seen them sometimes speed around campus. How do we control the speed of these vehicles? So, uh, well, so our branded ones, um, ours are fully branded, so these are ours. There are lots of other departments that uh, you all are part of that have uh, uh, golf carts. Ours, uh, we train our students, it's all student drivers, we tell them and we train them. Uh, no faster than 15 miles an hour when you're on a road. If you're near pedestrians, you have to go the speed of the pedestrians and that we really work with them to try and be safe. And I know some of you are saying, well, I've seen these golf carts go a little bit faster than that. So if you do see that, let us know. Um, if you see a golf cart that's not branded like this, it should have a four digit number on it. Write that down, let us know, and we'll let that department know that their vehicle was driving too fast. Other options that we have out there. We have a, a program with uh, Ford Go Bike, the bike share program. That's a station to station bike share. We have programs with um, Zipcar, and Zipcar is you, you rent a car, you pick it up, you go use it, and you drop it at that same spot. Another really cool car share program is called Gig Car Share, Get In and Go. It's run by AAA. Um, you can pick up that car anywhere and then drop it uh, anywhere. So it's a point A to point B. So it's like one way, it's like a one way car. And it's really, you just pay by the mile. Um, and it's good in Oakland, Berkeley, Albany, Alameda. Um, I use it sometimes to drive home. I just hop, I, it's, it's, I don't wanna take the bus. So I'll find one near me um, and drive it home and then just leave it in front of my house. It's pretty cool. Uber and Lyft, we've been working with both Uber and Lyft to try and get them to uh, adhere to our pickup and drop off spots. I know some of you have noticed that the, uh, these vehicles are wandering around campus in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day because a student is in the middle of campus and says, pick me up here. 
uh, we're trying to really enforce um, uh, with Uber uh, and Lyft that they need to adhere. We've set up seven uh, pick up and drop up uh, uh, pick up and drop off locations across campus. So we're working on that. What are the two big headaches when coming to campus with your car? Finding a parking space and the really annoying coming back to your car <laughs> and seeing one of these on your windshield. It's, uh, it's something that you don't like, especially if you've already paid for a very expensive parking permit. So we're working to try and help so that you don't get a parking citation. And what we're working on is doing enforcement by your license plate. And so what we'd like you to do is go to our website and um, click on, let's go back one page, uh, click up on the upper right-hand corner, My PT Online. You'll take you to this next page where you'll log in with your CalNet ID, and it will say Add Vehicles. You will add your vehicle, and now you've associated your vehicle with your permit. We now know your license plate. We can now uh, enforce by license plate rather than uh, worrying about your hang tag. So in case your hang tag has fallen off, you've shared it with a spouse, you've shared it with you know, whomever, uh, you, took, you left it at home, um, that's very annoying. You've paid for the permit, yet we gave you a citation. Now we'll be able to enforce by license plate. <laughs> All right, the future of parking, doing less with less. Um, so yes, we are um, going to be losing a parking lot um, this fall. Uh, the Upper Hurst parking structure uh, in the uh, northeast uh, corner of campus um, to help uh, because the Goldman School of Public Policy is expanding its academic space and then we're bringing in some much needed um, housing for uh, uh, young faculty and graduate students. Uh, but it does mean that for two years we'll be without that parking structure and when it comes back it'll have fewer parking spaces. It'll be down to about 170 parking spaces when it comes back. So what are we going to do to mitigate that? Three different things. First, we're gonna add a shuttle to the east side of campus that will go from the Foothill lot to the Mining Circle to the Clark Kerr campus. And what that helps with is you can now park your car up a Foothill lot. We realize that that's really up the hill. It's not very easy to walk down from that Foothill lot. So we will, uh, uh, we will have a shuttle that will get you from the Foothill lot down to the Mining Circle. Um, and then the other thing we have is out at the Clark Kerr campus, Clark Kerr Southwest, Every day we have about 100, 120 open parking spaces. So those of you who drive in from the east, come down Derby and take a right on Waring. There's a parking lot right there um, that's actually wide open uh, and we'd love to have you park there and free up some of the parking spaces that are on the central campus. And to help you with that, you can't really see this, it's kind of washed out, but you'll see some green and red dots. What we've done is we've installed real-time occupancy sensors in these lots. So we've got it into the CKC Southwest lot and we'll have it in the Foothill lot before fall. And so you can tell before you get to the lot, is there space available? There's a, a mobile app that we are just launching that will be uh, on our website and will actually give you directions to the lot. So before you leave home, you can pull up and say, oh, look, there's 100 spaces, there's 100 green dots on there. I'm gonna go to that lot rather than get frustrated and drive to the um, Foothill lot and say, oh, it's full, now you must drive somewhere else and find uh, somewhere else to park. Um, you'll be able to know before you get there. So that's my time here. Some pretty exciting stuff about parking. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to <laughs> introduce uh, Sally McGarrahan. Sure, me introduced. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. So last time I was here, I spoke a bit, kind of gave the overview of who we are, and this time I'm going into the details of what we're working on at the moment. So I'm gonna talk about the campus survey results, show you, well, screenshots of our updated website, and talk a bit about the less with less. So as many of you, I hope, know, uh, we put out a campus-wide survey at the end of last year. We have gotten the results. Um, uh, we had a pretty good response on the survey, and as you can see from this in general across our categories, we score uh, it from the high twos to the high threes. Our goal over the next several years is to get us consistently up into, from the high threes to the high fours, um, and I'm optimistic that we will get there. We asked you general questions about your satisfaction level with our maintenance operations, and um, you can see a few things in this slide. The first is that our faculty are tough graders. Um, there are no easy A's <laughs> on, on this campus. Um, and then encouragingly, you, you like our staff. You, you appreciate our professionalism um, and the quality of our work. You would like us to be um, there more quickly and be more responsive. Similarly, with um, custodial and grounds, you, you see our staff as professional and courteous. You would like to see a whole lot more of us. 
The um, survey company that we used act, does peer comparison with, um, with your peers. Um, in this case, this is our comparison to similar large urban public research universities. Uh, and what I take from this slide is we are all struggling with the same thing. We are all struggling with providing services in a time of um, reduced resources. And we're at our peer level. Our goal is, you know, we want to be uh, better, but, but this is the world we're in. I was actually happy to see that the general satisfaction, we outperformed our, our peers. So I want to talk a bit about um, some specifics. We got thousands of, of customer responses, and I have to say a significant number of them were, is anyone actually going to read this? And are, are you actually going to do anything with this survey? And so I, this is my opportunity to say that, yes, we are. Um, we've read, a lot, read the responses. We're going to do more work on them. So what I'm, I'm bringing here is sort of the high-level initial reaction. I'm also going to point out I'm talking about all the negatives. We actually got a lot of responses that were quite positive and quite supportive of, of what we're doing. So for custodial, you said you want more frequent custodial service, especially in the heavily used restrooms. You would like cleaner offices, um, and you'd like to see more deep cleaning. So even if we're keeping the surface level clean, you'd like to see where we, you know, that we can go to windows and floors. So we will do all of the above. We're going to see if we can staff more day porter service. We have it now in the GA, near the GA classrooms. So we're going to try to spread that out. Um, we, as you'll see when I talk about the website, we have uh, established some cleaning, minimum cleaning frequencies. We're going to make sure that we make at least those. Uh, and we're looking to how we can incorporate an annual, you know, a spread of several years, uh, annual deep cleaning into all of our campus facilities. For maintenance, you are hot or you are cold. Sometimes <laughs> in the same building at the same time, you're, you're both. Um, and you know, quite honestly, this is the nature of our facilities. Um, temperature is subjective, and our buildings actually in most cases were not designed to provide the thermal comfort that modern buildings are. So it is a constant struggle, and our systems are, are broken. So, um, you know, and when they break, they break exuberantly. They take down sort of everything around them. So um, it is, this, is a, this is a constant challenge for us. Um, our buildings are in poor condition, and we are all worried that this is starting to affect the campus reputation, um, and you want us to be quicker. So we're looking at multiple avenues for this. Capital renewal is our, um, our avenue for improving our systems and buildings to the point where we can maintain them, and they have systems that support what you need. We are continue to support our staff so we can be effective um, in, in how we respond. Uh, we're, we emphasize preventative maintenance. That's the best way to prevent uh, catastrophic, catastrophic failures. Um, and we're looking at doing our work smarter and better so that we spend less time fiddling around in the office and more time actually doing effective maintenance out in the field. Recycling, this is a, a short slide, but basically, a lot of confusion about what we're doing with our recycling program. Um, and this is zero waste is a huge goal. It's very complex about how we uh, implement it in different buildings. We are going to be clearer about what we're doing. Um, and you want more big bellies on campus, and we're going to try to do that. In general, you say you'd, you'd like more information on our work orders. You want to know um, the status. Uh, you didn't know the, the work order submission process at all. Um, and, you, and fundamentally, we asked a question in the survey to please tell us your priority for things. And you questioned us even asking that of you because everything is important. So what we're going to do is um, continue to use our, our newly implemented work order system, which is extremely robust in the status updates we can provide you. And we're going to make sure we're using that effectively. Um, we are going to communicate better. This is a a challenge and a goal, um, and we're going to get out there and, and tell you what we're doing. That's part of the website that I'll refer to later. And then we need to communicate you, to you about the hard choices that we have to make. We simply cannot do everything that either we used to do um, or that people want. And we have to explain to you why we're making the choices we're making and how we come to those choices. So speaking of the website, um, I was going to try to link to it, but um, smarter technological heads prevailed, so <laughs> I'm just going to show you some screenshots. But the goal here, and this is actually a real um, priority for Mark, is making sure that we are communicating effectively. And so we have completely revamped our website so that tells you what we do, how to reach us, gives you resources for 
um, for, for why we do things, such as our recharge services uh, guide. And a really key thing that we've done is list our custodial frequencies. So if you go to the website, you'll see these pictures that have space types. And in those, if you click on those, it will tell you what is cleaned weekly, what is cleaned daily, what is cleaned monthly, what is cleaned less than that, and what's cleaned only if you ask us. And the goal here is, is um, multifaceted. One is so you know, am I, is my, when, how often is my office trash going to be picked up? And that will be helpful in two ways. If it hasn't been, been picked up in that frequency, we want to know. If you're expecting it to be done more frequently, you can go to this and know that we actually are meeting our minimum frequencies that we, uh, that we have established. So please do go to the website. Uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff on there. And then very quickly, less with less. Um, for us, because we don't control demand, um, we have more students, we have older buildings, uh, there's nothing we can do to, to reduce what we have to do, but we can be smarter. And we, we're approaching this in two ways. One is capital renewal. Uh, we are very thoughtful about the projects we do to make sure that we, um, we make the campus more maintainable. And then in particular, we're doing work with the savings that we have obtained through purchasing the cogen plant. And we're looking to do projects with that that achieve a multifold benefit. They make they reduce your frustration and your experience of the buildings. They reduce utility rates because that will continue our savings. Um, and they reduce maintenance impacts so that we have more time to spend doing other things. Um, obviously, we have to create the savings to continue the projects, but this is, these are the examples of the kind of projects we do. Um, autoclaves, constant frustration. They are always broken. They're difficult to maintain. We've been struggling to just keep them limping along. We're looking at replacing them all together in sort of en masse. Um, pony chillers, instead of having large uh, chillers unaligned with the demand in the building, we're trying to put smaller targeted chillers in. They're more effective and they're, and they're easier to maintain. VFDs and motors throughout the campus, if we can, they give us greater control, um, which again is more energy efficient. And LED lighting, the lights go out less frequently. Um, and uh, so they reduce the maintenance burden, they reduce, reduce utility costs, and in a lot of ways they improve lighting. So that was a very quick explanation of what we're doing. Um, please feel free to ask questions uh, later. And with that, welcome back, Mark Fisher. So thanks to Russ and Seamus and Sally. So it's a great team, and a lot of effort goes into all the things you see there. And I think we're making um, solid improvements in this, these areas of endeavor and a lot of other places on, in our organization. So um, kudos to them for the successes. And um, I think these are all going to be improvements that will make your job's easier. And you can also help us by, for example, in the last thing when Sally was talking about service levels, when you see something that doesn't meet the service level that's been projected or is on the website, let us know. It means that we're not doing something. And your set of eyes really help us understand where we may not be um, providing the service that we say we should be. OK. Um, I'm now happy to introduce our Vice Chancellor for Research, Randy Katz. Um, Randy received his undergraduate degree from Cornell University and his MS and PhD from school here in UC Berkeley. He joined the Berkeley faculty in 1983 and since 1996 has been the United Microtechnologies Corporation Distinguished Professor in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. That's a mouthful. Um, and on January 1st, 2018, a little after I started here, Randy was appointed as the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Berkeley. In that role, he provides primary leadership in research policy planning administration, including relations between the university and industry, um, research compliance, research communications, and research support for the Berkeley campus. His portfolio includes management of over 50 campus research units, 12 research museums and remote field stations, research administration offices, including the Office of Research Administration and Compliance, the Office of Intellectual Property and Industry, Industry Relation Alliances, and the Office of Laboratory Animal Care. Um, and on top of that, a personal thank you to Randy because he's been instrumental in um, taking what was CSS, breaking it up into six regions, and creating what we're now calling Berkeley Regional Services. And he has been a key player in that effort and a real partner for me over the last year as we've gone through that. So please join me in welcoming uh, Vice Chancellor Randy Katz. Thank you. 
You know, I was sitting up here in the front thinking about all the jokes I was going to make about UC Path. But then I thought to myself, I really do want to get paid on April 1st. <laughs> so uh, wonderful to be here and to have an opportunity to tell you about you know, the research part of the number one public research university in the world. I want to read to you our mission statement for the Vice Chancellor for Research's office um, to set the stage. So our mission is to sustain and enhance Berkeley's infrastructure for research our intellectual organization. As Mark mentioned, we have over 50 research institutes, organized research units on campus, museums, natural reserves, all, all manner of infrastructure in support of research. Uh, facilities, so we have several major facilities on campus. The microelectronics, actually nanotechnology laboratory, for example, the genomic sequencing laboratory, and so on. Funding. We are running at about 750 to 800 million dollars per year in externally sponsored research on the campus, and that represents a tremendous amount of resources for us to uh, advance the boundaries of knowledge and to have major impact in uh, the lives of people uh, in, in California and the world. Services, so as Mark alluded to, we have over 40,000 research animals on campus that are used to advance our biomedical research projects. We have services for taking our faculty and students' intellectual property and turning them into patents that can spark economic development in the, in the Berkeley area and the Greater Bay Area and beyond. So a set of services associated with that. Services, I see Pat Goff over there, so services that keep our campus safe and uh, uh, protect our, 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 our workforce and our researchers as they go about their work on the campus. And finally, our processes. So we process all of those great faculty proposals to turn into that $800 billion a year in sponsored research, as well as supporting the animal laboratories and many, many other kinds of things. And so those elements, the intellectual organization, facilities, funding, services, and processes should be the leading environment for our faculty, students, and researchers on campus to pursue the kind of scholarship that, when it comes to the number one public research university, it's the scholarship that changes the world. That's what Berkeley is about. I'll give you three examples of this world-changing, world-impacting research. Our space sciences lab last fall contributed to the Parker Solar Probe, which was launched from Cape Canaveral, and it made its way to the, to, in close proximity to the sun. It's the, the first human-made object to get as close to, it is the closest of any human-made object to the sun, and it is detecting and touching the solar wind to understand its composition. No scientist has ever known what is the composition of the solar wind, which has a, a pretty big effect on, on the environment around the Earth and even has impacts on our weather, communications, all kinds of things. That, that probe has to survive temperatures which exceed a million degrees. Imagine designing an apparatus that will fly from Earth to the sun survive a million degrees and be able to detect and communicate back to Earth what it has found. An amazing device that is collecting data that the scientists are just starting to study right now. Second major breakthrough uh, of recent memory at Berkeley is the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology by Professor Jennifer Doudna and her colleagues at the Innovative Genomics Institute. Yesterday, the Patent Office issued a third major patent to uh, a set of inventors, including the University of California, Berkeley, also UCSF, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and Jennifer's collaborators at the University of Vienna and a few other places, which is a very, very fundamental patent about the technique of latching on to DNA and being able to slice it, dice it, for the purposes of genome editing. This is such a fundamental patent 
that it virtually assures that any company that wishes to use this technology to create new therapies for humans or to uh, process, you know, do various modifications to plants and so on, will have to practice this patent. It is, it is a fundamental patent uh, in the area of genome editing that was just granted to us. Take that, MIT. <laughs> and the third element is, while Berkeley is a great campus in terms of its physical sciences and uh, biological sciences, it is also a great campus in all of its research endeavors, including the social sciences. And so my third example is the work that is being done in our Goldman School of Public Policy to understand the implications of uh, economic development and social mobility in various communities in the Bay Area. So the example, which you may or may not find surprising, is that if you are an immigrant to the United States, it's much better for you to live in San Francisco or San Jose than, let's say, in Fremont. Why is that? Why would that necessarily be the, the case? I mean, I live in San Francisco. I think it's a pretty nice place to live. Uh, I don't see any problem necessarily living in Fremont. When you actually look at the economic data, the demographics, the geography, the geopolitics, San Francisco and San Jose have much more and much easier to access legal services than the city of Fremont does. So if you're an immigrant and you're, you are moving forward towards citizenship, permanent residency and citizenship, access to legal services that are frequent and close is extremely valuable in moving from your immigrant status to your citizenship status, which allows you to advance more rapidly economically and enhance your social and economic mobility in American society. And so while that observation is of great interest to researchers itself, you now have the opportunity to work with the city of Fremont with the data that shows the importance of access to legal services for immigrant communities and talk to the city about making some investments in legal services within the city of Fremont to help advance the social and economic mobility of their immigrant populations. So social science is moving from collect the data, understand the data, to act on that data to have impact on people's lives. This is the kind of world-changing research that is a signature of what Berkeley does. And so I have within my office five priorities. The first one is to enhance innovation and entrepreneurship. Our uh, uh, neighbor to the south is famous for creating Silicon Valley. If you actually look at the data, the, the sort of high technology industry has moved from the south towards San Francisco. And the center point of high tech industry in the Bay Area really these days is the peninsula in San Francisco, which of course we're a lot closer to than that other university is. <laughs> but really, you know, there is no 21st century modern university that doesn't see part of its mission as having fundamental economic impact in its community. To take the fruits of the research that are being developed in its laboratories and translate that into a capability of having impact on people's lives. It may be technological products. It may be new biomedical therapies. It may be new ways of solving problems, but it has to be translated from the thoughts in the professor and graduate students and student minds to something that has impact on people's lives. And so that's really what innovation and entrepreneurship are about. When I was a graduate student at Berkeley in the 70s, Faculty working on, on sort of startup companies on the side kept it absolutely secret. Today it's something that we should, should actually honor, cherish, and take credit for the economic impact that our university is having in California and in the world. Second element is advancing comprehensive excellence in research. I just gave you a story that spanned from the physical sciences to the social science, and the mark of Berkeley is this comprehensive research excellence. In some sense, a motto for our university is excellence at scale. We have the quality of Harvard and the size of Michigan State. 
and we should embrace that. We're big, we're bold, and we're good all at the same time. We have a kind of size of student body that we train, we educate a huge number of people who go on to leadership positions in the United States, and we provide access to a large community of students to come to our university and study. And they are taught by the leading researchers in their fields. Because I can tell you, the last time I was in this room, I was teaching 700 electrical engineering and computer science sophomores the basis of how to program computers for high performance in this room. Third priority is improving our budget transparency. And I think this is, this is a mantra from all levels of the, the university administration of let's open up the kimono and have a look at how this university is financed, which for someone who's been here for over 40 years is one of the great mysteries of the universe. <laughs> but we're starting to really understand what's going on. And one of the collaborations that I tremendously cherish with Mark is in the regionalization of campus shared services, working with some fantastic analytical minds amongst our staff, we developed a, a model of how workload translates into staffing needs based on the number of uh, purchasing transactions and, and hirings of students and, and uh, academic researchers and staff and all of those things and how many proposals are submitted and so on, how much People of different kinds do you need to support that level of activity? That's the first time I've ever seen kind of activity-based budgeting going on in this campus. That's a tremendous tool. It may be that we used it for allocation. We have this much money and wish we had that much money, but we had a way of allocating the resources that was fair based on the workload. That's the essence of budget transparency. And, and you know, I, there's a lot of, activity going on right now. One of the, the administration's initiatives is a, is a new financial model, which is embracing this concept of, of you know, giving units the ability to pay based on their activities, uh, which I think will be you know, sort of a very, very interesting opportunity for the campus going forward to fairly size and correctly size our, our sort of enterprise based on the work that has to be done. Fourth priority is to support the campus's strategic plan. Now, uh, every time you get a new chancellor, and I've seen a few, they initiate a strategic planning activity, and uh, our chancellor, Carol Christ, is no different. But something that is different this time around is that actually it is synchronized with a major fundraising campaign, which is in the planning stages right now. So you can have the dream and aspirations of your strategic plan connected to the opportunity to build the fundraising campaign around those priorities. Now, a lot of them have to do with, it's sort of interesting to observe, again, for someone who's been here for a long time, a real focus on the undergraduate experience at Berkeley. We are a research powerhouse. I'm the vice chancellor for research. We want to get more undergraduates involved in research. but. Traditionally, research universities don't talk about what the life of an undergraduate is like. That discussion has changed under this chancellor. So uh, making it possible for our students to thrive, not just survive, and the housing issues and so on are really a high priority for her. But part of her priorities also are what are the next societally important research topics that the university should focus on in terms of attempting to improve the lives of people in California and beyond. And those are called signature initiatives. And so the kinds of signature initiatives that, that we want to support as part of the research enterprise, some of them won't surprise you very much, I suspect. One is environment, climate, and sustainability, and justice in that context. A second one is health and wellness which also has dimensions of justice and sustainability associated with it. Uh, we're also interested in what happens in the world of work as artificial intelligence becomes more pervasive. How can we use it to make our jobs better? How, how will the nature of work change in the face of it? How will the nature of science change when we go into a new paradigm which is beyond uh, 
theoretical or experimental research or even computational research or even data-based research to data-directed research. And that will involve artificial intelligence. Democracy and, and justice concepts around the kind of dialogues that we have with each other, which we know have been tremendously strained over the last couple of years. So these are big, big challenges for 21st century society, and Berkeley is organizing itself to address them. And my final point is uh, related a little bit to uh, doing less with less, but actually my goal is to do more with more because I want to build our research enterprise to bring in more money to Berkeley to support more research, to generate more indirect cost recovery that can help support many operations of the university. And as part of that, we want to improve the efficiency of our infrastructure. We have, as Sally mentioned, a lot of challenges with our aging, under-maintained infrastructure for research and for many other aspects of the university. How do we bring in funding to help improve and update that? The services that we have, we want them to be efficient. And then the processes, and in part things like the campus shared resources and the regionalization are a way of bringing to parts of the campus which never had access to uh, high quality research administration, now will get their fair share of administrative support for the kind of research that they do. This is a set of complicated things we're undertaking to improve the environment for research, for teaching, and for service at the university that are so important. And with that, I think I'll, I'll end and uh, maybe save uh, time for questions at the very end. Thank you. Wow, I like the idea of more. Um, th that would be really different, wouldn't it? Okay, so my, uh, I'm, I'm honored to have my next speaker is, or guest is Oscar Dubon, our Vice Chancellor for uh, Equity and Inclusion. And Oscar, you're gonna have to w find your way out of there. Oscar's a graduate of UCLA and earned his MS and PhD at Berkeley and joined the UC Berkeley faculty in engineering in 2000. And I was just doing the calculation in my head and I was thinking, I, he might have been an undergraduate when I started at UCLA, and that's scary. Um, previously, Oscar served as the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion in the College of Engineering. In 2016, Oscar received the Chancellor's Award for Advancing Institutional Excellence in Equity. In 2017, Oscar was appointed Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion where he leads campus-wide efforts to broaden the participation of all members of the campus community, particularly those who have been historically underrepresented and or unwelcomed in the pursuit of the university's mission of access and excellence. And, and I work with Oscar, we work with Oscar a lot, and um, he's, a, he's doing a huge amount of good work in this area. Through the work of the Division of Equity and Inclusion, campus partners and the broader campus community, Oscar envisions a campus where all Berkeley students Faculty and staff feel welcome, valued, and supported. Please join me in welcoming uh, Vice Chancellor Oscar Dubon to the stage. Oscar. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, Randy, I was really inspired by your presentation. Um, as an engineer, I really appreciate uh, that vision, but also as a citizen of this world and the impact that UC Berkeley has, um, I really value that. Um, when I think about that, it just made me think about sort of how would I synthesize in a nutshell what the work of ENI is. And um, I, I was thinking there and I came up, it's, it's finding belonging in our excellence. I think that really brings it all together in terms of what we try to do in, uh, in the division of ENI and how we seek to engage uh, the campus. The other thing I think about um, is the idea of impact on people's lives. You know, we raise the issue, whose lives? Not everyone's lives are the same. So recognizing, not excluding lives, but recognizing that we all have our unique life trajectories and making sure that we are engaging comprehensively in that way. Um, the other part I, I thought about is um, how faculty and student minds are a central part of innovation. So whose minds are part of that innovation? You know, which faculty 
you know, which graduate students, which undergraduate students, which staff were part of that innovation. So those are all important issues that I think about as we do the work um, in ENI. And uh, finally, uh, I think about um, who do we educate, right? This is a big part that uh, that Randy mentioned around uh, the chancellor's the chancellor's vision around undergraduate education. Um, this is really a fundamental change in the paradigm of who we are, and I really uh, take that to heart because that's not an easy change. Uh, we are focused on research. Um, I, I've always said we think of a. Uh, undergraduates as junior graduate students. And if you're a junior graduate student, there's no better place than UC Berkeley for you. And we know that evidentially, from evidence around going to uh, students who move on to graduate school, who move on to have, uh, be leaders in their fields, be leaders in their community based on their experience here on campus. So the part is, which students are we providing that opportunity for? How are we opening access? So that's really all part of the work of ENI. So I just, those are just some thoughts that I had as I was mesmerized by, uh, by Randy's uh, vision around the, the research enterprise on, at UC Berkeley, which is a super important piece of what Berkeley is about, but it's not the only piece. All right, so I, went, I wrote some notes. I'd like to share those so I can really be focused on what I want to share with you. First of all, I'd like to know, how many students are here? How many, how many faculty? Okay, so we are staff. This is a, this is, we are a community of staff members today and I'm going to think about that as I, that's what I was thinking when I, and expecting when I wrote my notes. Thank you for your invitation. I am really delighted to be here. Um, I wish to thank you for your service on the campus community and beyond. Um, I also like to, uh, something I have learned to appreciate is that some of your work is highly visible, but some of it happens in the, in the background. Um, nonetheless, all of the work is essential for us to meet our mission of education, knowledge creation, and service to California and beyond. So I want to acknowledge that, and I want to thank you for that, because I think that oftentimes we don't do enough um, uh, appreciation in thanking uh, all the work that happens, not just the work that's visibly happening. This summer, I will have completed two years uh, uh, being a, a Vice Chancellor for Equity Inclusion. And as uh, Mark mentioned, I've been here almost three decades. I came here when I was 22 years old. So I, I grew up in this place as a graduate student, as a postdoc, and then as a faculty member, and now as an administrator. I've been an administrator for now almost seven years. And despite being here for so long, the time that I have spent in the last two years has been eye-opening and enriching in so many ways. Um, despite my short time as VCI, I have learned a great deal from you and others and deepened my appreciation for the remar remarkable, beautiful contributions that so many members of the campus community make. And that is always an issue of a, a, just a wonderment about how many things happen, even when we think about they sh probably shouldn't happen because there's not enough to do the work that needs to be done, but we still manage somehow to do it. It is part of our work, as Randy mentioned, to find other ways to bring more to do more, rather than to ask you to do more with less. And I think that's something that is certainly omnipresent in my mind and certainly in the mind of my, uh, le uh, my uh, colleagues in leadership. I have also gained a deep appreciation of the distance that we have yet to travel in pursuit of our vision of becoming an institution of excellence and belonging. In the division, we think a great deal about both belonging and othering and excluding. This said, we are not the compliance arm for institutional belonging. I am not here to be a compliance officer to, about campus climate, around our challenges and diversity. Instead, I am here to be a partner and an ally with you all because the work has to happen comprehensively with all of us, not just with a subset of people on campus. We help to build bridges that bring belonging to different dimensions of our campus. That work can only happen through partnership and leadership. 
And one of the ones I'd like to mention is actually some of the work that we have done around uh, staff, uh, staff uh, equity and inclusion with uh, HR and with Mark. And that's been really important work. It's probably some of the more challenging work for ENI because that's not, to be frank with you, the way ENI was designed and continues to exist, it really it has been a student-centered um, organization. And so as we move forward, that's something that I certainly have in mind about what we need to do to be more nimble and also be more effective as partners in other areas around staff diversity and in equity and inclusion, as well as faculty equity and inclusion. But one of the things I was really uh, excited about is um, the way that we have approached issues around st staff uh, HR. And one of those is the development of a, um, of a program that some of you may have heard of, the Leadership and Career Enhancement Program, LCEP. I think that is not the end all, but that's the beginning of a journey of understanding that diversity in leadership matters, both staff and faculty, and it doesn't happen by itself. We need to find ways to, in fact, deconstruct and reform all of those pieces that has led us to the point that we are at, which is where there is a very lim uh, there's very limited diversity in both faculty and, uh, and staff. And I'll give you an example. How many of you have taken the My Experience survey? Okay, first of all, thank you for taking it. Don't tell me how it worked, but I don't want you to uh, let other people know about it, let other people take that survey. We'll have a nice conversation about the My Experience survey at the end, um, but I encourage the rest of you to take it. But when I took the survey, my sense is that based on just how I answered my questions, that I could probably be identified among the thousands of people on campus, based on just the intersection of my role and my personal identity. Now, I took it because all that information would be kept anonymously. So there would be, we're gonna, we adhere to anonymity, confidentiality. There is no way that uh, we would uh, disaggregate data in a way that uh, it would determine who you are. But you know, that really, to me, just speaks to where we were at on campus around certain issues of who is, in the, who is at the table when decisions are being made, both among staff and also among faculty. The other part that I'm really excited about is this idea, this concept of developing a staff equity advisors network. So one of the things that I feel has been really effective for faculty is we have a network of faculty equity advisors. It's taken the better part of a decade to really start to codify some of the best practices and the impact that a network of faculty who are dedicated to values of equity and inclusion to have impact on things such as graduate admissions, um, faculty hiring, as well as issues around uh, campus, around um, uh, their local microclimates where the faculty members are in their departments. So to think about how that can be articulated to a model for staff, to me, is extremely important, extremely valuable, and is something that we really need to uh, pilot, find a, find a best practice, and then implement across uh, the campus. Now, again, this is not a compliance arm of anything. It's about making sure that we understand that when we feel belonging in our workplace, our work is higher quality. The more we feel that way, the more I feel belonging in my research, the more I make my students feel belonging, the more creative, the more impactful they're going to be in their research. They're gonna bring all of their dimensions of themselves into that work. And that's true in every aspect of the work that we do on this campus. So that's another one that I am extremely um, excited about. Um, this is not to say that we are where we need to be, but we are pulling the curtains back and examining with great honesty and sincerity what we are doing right and wrong, thereby exposing the structural inequities that we know exist, okay? But we're not here to, um, we live in, within a certain system. It doesn't mean that as individuals, we're all operating in a certain, with a certain intent, but we end up working a certain way because of the very system that we are in. So we need to examine our practices, we need to examine our structures to make sure that that is happening. So one of the things we're also doing is looking at uh, disaggregating the different types of um, uh, 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 job titles with, um, and looking at the demographics to understand where are the gaps, what can we do better to make sure that we are uh, addressing those structural inequities. There is one more part to that, and that's something called a constituent board. You're gonna read a little bit more about that in the message. 
Um, but that's really our uh, effort and attempt to really look at the systemic and structural issues that really are impeding belonging, that are impeding um, a sense that, yes, if, I, if I'm here, that my work is valued and that I have an opportunity for growth. Not just an opportunity for personal development, but an opportunity for advancement and growth in the organization. That may not look like in other places. So often we talk about ladders, but when you think about growth here and advancement, it's really more of a zigzag. You start here, you end up here, you end up here, and so forth. But there's still some sense of what that advancement should look like. And that's something that is our responsibility to continue to work on. So that's just one piece about how partnership and allyship works within ENI. There are many other uh, areas that we are working on. One of the areas that I'm particularly uh, excited about that really has had a transformation over the past couple of years that I've been here is around supporting the disabled community on campus. Um, there are just, um, the changes are staggering, I'll say. And I think in the next year or two, you're going to start to see the fruits of the investment that uh, staff and students and some faculty have made in this area. Um, I think about not just about the amazing uh, uh, transformations and proctoring that are happening. Um, the fact that um, we're now th focusing also on graduate students. We're focusing on understanding, having a, a, a professional to uh, understand issues around housing. But also thinking more broadly, you know, bringing on a um, ADA uh, 504 officer, Ella Callow, who is really visioning the issue around disability beyond the students, around working with HR, around staff matters working with the faculty, and working with those members of our community that maybe fall in gaps, which tend to be some of the hard parts around supporting disability. Disability, uh, uh, achieving um, the compliance, I'm gonna use compliance this time, around disability should be top in our priority because it's a civil rights matter. It's not, uh, it's a nice thing to do. This is when we support uh, accommodations for our members of our community, we are supporting their civil rights. And that's the level of seriousness that we really need to take when we do that work. But I'm really excited where we're heading. We have other, I have seen inroads in other areas. I think the African American Initiative is finally really taking off. Um, there's a Fannie Lou Hamer Resource Center that is doing great work. Um, there's also, we have our first cohort of African American Initiative scholars who came in as freshmen this year. And we're continuing to build the more comprehensive picture around what it means to support students, the thriving versus surviving, which is not just seeing the numbers, but making sure that we're finding that belonging and excellence in the students as well, and that the students feel that they're part of that. So I think that's something that's also really exciting. I think there's a lot of work that has gone into supporting, uh, uh, building a relationship with the Native American community, but we have far, far to go in that area. And it begins by acknowledging and taking responsibilities for the, the injustices that we, on, as an institution, have perpetrated on the community, on their very land. And that's something we need to continue to acknowledge and see how we can build that bridge. That is, involves and starts with, as in, we've worked in partnership with Randy, around um, uh, how we can return the thousands of sacred belongings, including, including human remains, to our community, to our Native American community. Um, but it also involves making sure that we acknowledge that relationship, the importance of the Native community, the fact that we are on their land, in this unceded land, doing all of those things while fostering that excellence that comes from providing access to equitable access to education by providing equal access to research opportunities. So doing all of that work, there's a lot of work to be done, but I see so much investment that I'm really excited that, about what's gonna happen in the next two or three years. There's another part around HSI, um, Hispanic Serving Institution. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, that, the Chancellor Chris mentioned that in 10 years we're going to become HSI. I'm gonna put a little context around that. HSI is a definition from the Department of Education. And the way it works, it says, if 25% of your enrolled undergraduate students um, are uh, Latinx, and there are other couple other factors, then you can be designated as HSI. And I'm just put a context to be 25% Latinx undergraduates means that we're going to be underrepresented by a factor of two with respect to the California population of public high school graduates, who are more well, over 50% of California public high school graduates are Latinx. The point isn't that 
we're going to suddenly look like a, you know, a, a college at no, UNAM, the college in Mexico City. The point is that we have a Latinx community, a Latinx, a Latinx culture in the United States that is uniquely, has its own unique contributions to our society here and is engaged in the various dimensions of society already and it has for hundreds of years. So our goal is to move that forward, but what that will do is not just lift our ability to serve California and the Latinx community, but all of those, um, all of those communities that have been historically underrepresented or have, have been excluded in the past. So it's really a collective effort. It's not about pointing one group versus another, but it's using that avenue so that we can be more open and accessible to Californians as California is evolving in the 21st century, looking different than it was in, 19, uh, in 1868. So those are some of the, I know I'm almost, oh, <laughs> those are some of the initiatives that uh, we're undertaking. I am be thrilled to, uh, to uh, answer any questions if there's time later. And um, also, uh, let's go out there and find the belonging and the excellence of the work that we do. I would uh, certainly like to know how you're doing that and welcome your input. So thank you very much. Okay, so thanks, Oscar. Um, two remaining big topics. Uh, uh, one of them is on the regional services model, and I'd like to um, uh, ask each of the regional... <laughs> it's Oscar's little book. Um, uh, ask each of the regional directors to come up with their um, HR manager uh, and join me on the stage, if we will, so that we can all see who's doing this great work and... Um, here they all come. Excellent. So we now have six regional service centers, as you may know. The last one really was um, uh, Region 6, or BEARS, which serves the vice chancellors, if you will, in the, in the central administration. And um, that, that region really just set up in January. So this is really relatively new for the campus. I think the first region was a little over a year ago. And um, this has taken a huge effort on a lot of people's part to pull this together. So um, the benefit in this, I believe, is that we are now providing services closer to all of you um, with folks that you can have direct contact with and uh, see and meet on a regular basis. The response has been really great. Um, uh, one of my favorite comments recently was a dean, and I won't throw her completely under the bus. But anyway, her, the compliment was um, how improved the services were for her uh, division with uh, the regional service model. And, um, and I won't name names, but it was a dean that I, I would say isn't, doesn't easily give compliments like that. So it was a nice surprise. <laughs> Which dean could that be? You know, I'm not doing that. Anyway, these are the regions and on the slide. So the names are sort of interesting. Um, Urso is a name that's been around for a while. Each of the regions got to determine their own name for their region. And um, you can see them there. You can ask the regional directors the how and why of those names. I'm not going to try to go into that. But um, uh, they believe this, this, this presents their region well, which is great. Um, the first one is Urso, which is uh, College of Engineering, Environmental Design, School of Information, and related ORUs. And by the way, that was a big move, moving the ORUs out to the regions. So this was something that Urso, which has been around for a while, I think 12 years plus, is that right? Yeah, 12 years plus. And um, that was a, a big change for them. Um, their associate dean is Carl Van Bibber, you can see on there, and Cynthia Weekly, who's behind me, and Cynthia's gonna talk to us here in a bit. And then Ebony Wilson from um, the Urso region. So, and are they all Wait. together? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I didn't see that part. Okay, the Champs region, this was the first of the new regions, um, College of Chemistry, Division of Mathematical and Physical Sciences, uh, the related ORUs and field stations, um, including um, the Space Sciences Lab, which was a big shift, I think, to, to really, and I think there's some good work going on there. I see a head going up and down like that in the back. That's good. Um, and the associate dean here is Ron Cohen who has put a tremendous amount of personal energy into the success of the regional model and needs to be called out for that special effort. Um, his regional director, Samantha, 
Duty. Jury duty, okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, Jerry Nazaretti, who's here, is the HR manager. So um, again, one of the newest ones. Best is biology, uh, College of Natural Resources, Division of Biological Sciences, related to ORUs. And this is um, the associate dean is Rebecca Held. Um, Adam, I know, is here. I saw him earlier at the end there. And uh, HR manager, Anita Bailey. So welcome. Thank you. Um, and none, none of this has been easy, as you can imagine. They're taking over um, huge tasks and um, budgets that have been a little complicated. Uh, Randy talked about the model. And the model, you know, is, is I think, a great thing, but it, it did present some challenges for particular areas, and we continue to work on that. The SHARE region, this is one of the newest ones, uh, Division of Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities, Undergraduate Division, and the ORUs, and this is Max Alfhammer and Teal Sexton, Teal's here behind me, and um, uh, Anna Sanchez. And so, uh, again, this is, I think, just <laughs> December, <laughs> just December or January? December. So they're really um, new and up and running as well. And then the pros reason, which is also very new, uh, Berkeley Law, well, there are nine of these, I think, Haas School of Business, Optometry, Public Policy, uh, School of Education, Journalism, Public Health, Social Welfare, and Berkeley Extension. Um, this one is complicated. Obviously, um, all the deans make it a little bit more um, interesting. And... Um, <laughs> We've had a hard time getting a regional, regional associate dean, but John Flanagan, who's dean of optometry, has very nicely agreed over the last almost year to do this work for that region. He's done a great job, and all of his fellow deans really owe him uh, a lot of gratitude for that. The regional director there is, is Julia Arno. Julia is here. She joins us from UCOP. And Valerie Ventra Hutton is the HR manager. If you're in these regions and don't know these folks, this is really important. You, you see these faces and know the folks because um, with PATH going live, um, you're going to need them. Uh, okay, we can't have anything at Berkeley without a bear in it. So um, now it's, by the way, BRS, Berkeley Regional Services, which I pronounce BRS. And now we have the Bears region, which is all the vice chancellors. So um, administrative units, um, chancellor's office, EVCP, equity and inclusion, athletics, student affairs, uh, development, library, and the auxiliaries. And um, the professional schools region is complicated, but this one is no less complicated in terms of the number of players involved. And um, the, the regional associate dean kind of position, vice chancellor, is me. And um, we're working on that. And then Lori Tannehill <laughs> has taken us on. She's taken the challenge of working with all of us. We're fabulous. And Bradley Evans is our HR manager. So thanks to all of them. Um, do try to talk to them, get to know them if you don't already. Um, I think they're doing a great amount of work for the campus, and um, it, I think this is a sea change and a really good sea change, and I personally want to thank them all for their efforts and all the wonderful things that they're doing. All right. Unless you want to stick around for UC Path? Are you going to stick around for UC Path? Okay, good. Um, okay, Path. The next topic. First of all, everyone working on UC Path in the room, would you stand up? I know all these folks are, but everybody else, stand up if you're working on Path. And I'm going to stay standing because it seems to have taken over my life. Oh, come on, there must be more than that. I will just. Is this on? Just say. To just say briefly that um, Man of Our Project team, this is the last day of a short window that we have in March to do many of those transactions you all are dying for us to do during the transition. And unfortunately, therefore, much of our project team has not been able to join us here. So, Ah, yes. that explains it. <laughs> They're all busy doing UC PATH work. OK. All right. So at least I hope all of you have heard about PATH. If we, you haven't, we've done something wrong. And that, by the way, is, is Jan Crosby-Taylor. And Jan is in charge of communications around the PATH project. So. If you haven't heard about PATH, do see Jan at the end of this, <laughs> because we have a communication problem. OK. Um, this is a really important initiative for the Office of the President and um, for the campuses. And Berkeley is going live now. We're in the middle of the transition from our old system to the new PATH system. The thing that's interesting here was we had um, uh, a series of decisions to be made about whether we would go live now or wait until the fall. We were originally slated to go live with um, UC Irvine, UC Davis, and A&R. And A&R, Irvine backed out first. They weren't ready. 
Davis and A&R backed out a couple of weeks ago, and the Berkeley campus decided to go ahead and go forward. And, and some of you may wonder, why on earth did you do that? And um, um, uh, there's some really great reasons. First of all, we're, we're going without those other campuses, so we're getting a lot of attention, which is really fantastic. And we were able to leverage that, having a group go live, with UCOP for resources. So we have about 18 people on campus working with us from UCOP and from the PATH Center. And I guarantee you, if the other campuses were going live, we would not have gotten those resources. So this was, I think, really to Berkeley's advantage to go live now. Heather Archer, who's probably not in the room because she's also up to her eyeballs and work, um, was really a strong voice in this, suggesting that this was absolutely the right time for this campus. It's an ebb in terms of hiring. If we waited another month, we would be impacting hiring for the summer. And if we waited until the fall, we'd be impacting hiring for the fall and the academic year. And so there was, the decision was made to go forward um, for a lot of reasons, but those are two of the most primary reasons. And the last one probably is we have some really amazing staff working on PATH that frankly become fatigued if you don't just move this thing forward because if it doesn't wrap up, there's a lot of energy in it and um, we were really afraid that we would lose key staff members, which we could not afford to do. Um, having said all of that, that's all the great reasons to go forward. PATH is complicated. So we, we'll go live with PATH and there will be some breakage in the system. There's no question or breakage in terms of people being served by the system. The system itself, I would say, is essentially flawless except that it relies on all of us to be perfect in everything we do to implement the system. So the system will be blamed for things. It's not really a system issue, but it's really how we um, interface with that system. UCLA and UC Santa Barbara went live um, last fall. There's been a lot of issues. I think that Santa Barbara is stabilizing pretty quickly. LA has had a pretty difficult time. Why is that? Well, LA has a very different set of systems. They don't have the kind of infrastructure that we have at Berkeley. I keep saying Berkeley should be really proud of itself for all the integrated systems developed on this campus. I know that sort of work is not easy, but I also know that it really is a huge advantage for us that our systems all talk to each other. So I keep saying that, and I hope it's absolutely true in the rollout. But I do think it's going to make a very positive um, difference here for us. So um, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let Cynthia talk about some of the work that we're doing in the regions to make the transition to PATH as smooth as possible. So Cynthia Weekly, thank you. So good afternoon. It's nice to see so many of you and so many long-term colleagues, which is always uh, a, fun, a fun thing to do. Um, it is quite exciting and a bit surreal for those of you who've been around a while and have heard about UC PATH for like 10 years. It's actually here. Uh, so it's a little hard to believe that we're underway. Um, this has been a tremendous effort by so many committed people. And on behalf of all the regional directors, I just want to take a moment to thank all of these HR leaders who have really given us um, so much of their time and effort to give us the best chance of really being successful within the regions for the implementation of PATH. And so thank you all very, very much. Um, we have known for quite some time that we have a big challenge ahead of us, and I can assure you that a cadre of people have been planning extensively for it. Um, we have learned quite a bit from UCLA's implementation and have tried to address some of those issues and try to create some mitigating actions. Um, we also know for sure that there will be problems that we did not anticipate uh, or expect or prepare for. Um, but I am confident, however, that we have pulled together an organized approach of dealing and addressing problems that arise. Um, each region, with the really tight partnership of the UC PATH project team, with uh, Central Human Resources, with Academic Personnel Office, the um, triage team, as well as the command center team, stand all ready to assist. Um, the key message today, however, that I would like to impart is that we want to encourage all of you to contact your regional team for any problem that you encounter with UC PATH. If today you currently use the first contact team or you enter a ticket in service now, um, please continue to do that to uh, escalate any problem that you have within your region that you are being supported by. If today you submit an URSO um, email to the URSO alias for HR or payroll, you will continue to do that post uh, UC path. 
Um, the other thing too, if you need to contact any of your regional partners, human resources, academic personnel analyst, or research administrator within the region, please know that you can do that. That's the, the, Contacting the region is the best first place to get some assistance. If the issue then needs to be escalated, the team knows the escalation channels and knows what to do in order to get that particular issue addressed if it does need to be escalated. Um, the transition to UC Path will definitely be uh, challenging, but will certainly take a partnership of all of us working together on the campus. We are all learning the system together. We're learning the new ways uh, to conduct business in the HR and payroll space for our campus. Um, but one of the things I just want to impart, and we all collect collectively share this is that the region stand ready to serve and assist you. So again, please direct your questions, problems, issues that you might be experiencing with UC Path to your regions first, and then we will take it from there uh, and hopefully resolve the problem quite, quite quickly. Um, so do we have time for questions? Do we want? Okay, so we're thinking that we can take a few general questions. Um, if there's anything more specific to the region, then we probably think it's best to contact um, the regional director or your HR um, manager um, and to, to talk about some of those specifics. But we have folks here from the project team, from the, pro from the uh, PMO team here as well, and then we have our region team. So we can, we can probably take a couple general questions if anybody has any. It's so clear and everyone's just so ready to go. So uh, we're pretty excited about that then. Sure. Oh, there was one thing I was supposed to say, and this is probably what, what Jan might be wanting me to say. On the UC Path website, there's a recently new document called the Fact Sheet um, that has a lot of good information. So it's on the UC Path website. It's in like an orangish color. Um, and if you link to it, it'll provide uh, quite a bit of information that will be very helpful. Oh, that wasn't it, sorry, okay. So I'd like to invite all the Pathfinders. So you all, some of you may know that there are, now we have 90 Pathfinders. These are people across the campus who have been engaged with me since uh, September, October-ish, um, and are given monthly updates and activities sort of to keep everyone in, in, informed and, and figure out what we need to do. So at this time, some of these people with the beautiful bright shirts on, if you could stand up. If you're not wearing your fabulous Pathfinder shirt, at least kind of hold it on you. So go ahead and stand up. I just want to sort of have everybody kind of get a sense, and there's, there's many more of you out there. Um, there's folks from a UC Path. The, our change team is in the back corner. They also have them. There's more of you here. People are hiding. Uh, but anyway, so these T-shirts that you see that folks are showing, we will be out on campus either at Quick Stop support locations. That's for um, not the kind of stuff that our regional partners will be managing the more challenging stuff, but just basic like, oh, I need to find my paycheck on the new UC Path portal. Where do I do that? So we have this quick stop support activity going on and we'll be wearing these lovely t-shirts. And then we also are gonna be kind of about campus handing people um, little cards, particularly students, people walking by, are you an employee of the UC? Do you know about UC Path? Great, take this and go to the website and figure it out. So that's the idea. So now you'll know what these lovely t-shirts are and you can send people to us as you see us on campus um, starting the week of April 1st. No kidding. Thanks, Cynthia. I, I will add to what Cynthia said that one of the things you all can do is you can make sure and look at your pay stub from last month and the month before. And then look at your first pay stub in April, if you're uh, uh, monthly pay or bi-weekly, bi and just make sure it's accurate. Now, if you're a monthly pay person, I think the first paycheck is Monday, April 1st, two days before that, that information is available on this particular pay cycle on Saturday. So if you would, please look at your pay stub on Saturday, and if there's any anomaly at all, then some of the folks you just saw on the stage, get in contact with them, or however you're used to making contact with, with um, the service centers, and we can start to correct those anomalies. Um, I think there's some information in the back about what a pay stub will look like. I know there are some changes in the pay stub from uh, what you're used to seeing today, and the system, as I said earlier, the system is extremely accurate. So there may be some minor differences in your numbers based on the kind of precision that's involved with this particular system. And you would have seen this before when CalTime went live and your time accruals probably became much more precise. 
Same thing here with PATH. So just be prepared for that. And again, if there are any questions at all, make sure and get to us. If you work with students um, and they are either in working in your areas, make sure they've submitted time cards. Um, that's been one of the issues on the other campuses. And also um, that their address and data in the system is accurate. So if we all work together, we'll have as little breakage on our campus as possible. And um, that should really be our goal. So anyway, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for coming today. Are there any questions about any of the talks you heard today? But we'll take any or all questions at this point. Everybody's still here. Um, Randy and Oscar can answer questions if you have for them, or Sally, or Seamus, or Russ, and uh, certainly welcome your, your questions and comments. What a, oh, here we go. This is turned on. There you go. Hello. Oh. Hi, everyone. Um, my question is basically for Russ. I'm a lab manager over in plant microbial biology, so I'm very excited to hear about this accelerated procurement opportunity. Um, one of the things that uh, me and my colleagues are concerned about is we are currently in a position where we have org node approval and also chart field two approval. And I was wondering if those things are also going to go away under the uh, certain thresholds, especially for those with federal funding. If your area has special, I hate to say that word, We're special. We're all special. <laughs> <laughs> but have created different workflows, mm -hmm. then you should examine it. Because what will happen is it will, it will again, it will bypass org node approver also, unless you have put in your, your workflows, your independent workflows out there. So I, I don't know if that answered your question. Um, Basically, when I put through my requisition, I, um, I need a requisition creator to right. rubber stamp, and then I also need my research admin to then do a CF2 approval. So then I have to wait anywhere from zero to five days in order to have a rec turn into purchase order to then go out to vendor. And so I'm adding that additional time on top of receiving product. Okay, so you're, or the, the, um, you'll bypass certainly the requisitioner, Right? It will, by, depending on your dollar amount, it will bypass your org node approver. I am unsure, but we can find out with you. It will bypass? Oh, hi. Oh. Hi, hi. So, the Bear Buy X system expert um, CF1 and CF2 will not change at all. If you have been using the ad hoc approvers, those will also not change. Org node approval on the requisition level, if it's below the threshold, will go away. Any other questions? Otherwise, the CF2 remains. CF2 remains. Okay. And, and that, that, was, that was a critical functionality. CF2 will trigger at any dollar level right. in order to protect research fund approvals. It's kind of tough when I'm trying to order from Stanley Stockroom for same day delivery and I have to mm -hmm. wait three to five days in order to get that approved. Yeah, so at least Recreator Department Approver won't do that for you. If you've triggered CF1 or CF2, you will still be waiting for those turnaround times. Okay, thank you. Sure. Could they make sure that the card is assigned? Well, no, it just, won't. Yeah, just route. No, it'll route. Okay. Out there. Okay then, um, I think we're done, it's a wrap. So there's, I think, some food left back there still, though it looks like it went pretty well this time. So uh, at least grab an iced tea on the way out, and if there are any cookies or other goodies left, please take them, we don't wanna waste anything. And thank you for coming, we'll see you in the fall.